Oh, okay. There'll be folks come on later, I think. Um, good morning and welcome to the forum. Um, my name is Craig Volland. I'm a member of the forum committee. The forum's mission is to afford a platform for the discussion of significant issues, especially those which involve ethical values in the contemporary world and to promote critical thinking. This morning, we have a very timely program. Uh, it's called the social construction of crime and what we can do about it. And our speaker uh, is Spencer Graves. He's a Vietnam era veteran and holds a PhD in statistics, books, patents, published technical papers and software used all over the world. He is also a licensed professional engineer. He is program associate for KKFI Community Radio and produces content for Radioactive Magazine, which broadcasts on Tuesday from 6 to 6.30 p.m. He is also president of Friends of Community Media and secretary of PeaceWorks Kansas City and a member of the All Souls Forum Committee, obviously a busy guy. The Vietnam War made a compulsive fact checker out of him and he's been all over the political map, constantly looking for evidence to disprove, disprove current beliefs. Around 1999, he did a literature search for constructed reality. Key references from that search discussed social construction of crime, which is the main topic of today's presentation. So take it away, Spencer. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to try to share my screen here. And I've got um, uh, slides that I'm going to share that obviously the, um, the radio audience won't be able to see this. But in any case, uh, I want, want to mention that uh, this is actually my second time to speak to the forum. I spoke uh, 2019, March 3rd on media, uh, media and democracy in Kansas City and elsewhere. Uh, and um, I want to connect the themes that Craig mentioned with, uh, um, with the media uh, and uh, with the evolution of um, uh, income inequality and the evolution of the actually economic growth in the United States from 1790 to the present, uh, and then put that all together and how what we can do in Kansas City to improve the media and through that to improve the prospects for broadly shared economic growth. So, there's a Wikipedia article entitled United States Incarceration Rate that has a plot of the percent of the population in state and federal prisons. Between 1925 and 1975, that was relatively stable at a tenth of a percent of the US population. Uh, and in the last quarter of the 20th century, it shot up by a factor of basically five, almost five, um, crusting in 2006 or so at over a half a percent of the US population. And now it's down uh, closer to four tenths of a percent. But the question is what drove that increase? Uh, and how did I come to even look at this? So my wife was a psychotherapeutic social worker and she was talking to me in the uh, 1990s about constructed reality. And so I did a literature search on constructed reality. And I came up with research papers talking about the social construction of crime. So let me talk about what's constructed reality. When we're born, our brains are a mass of neurons without knowing how to interpret the signals they receive. Gradually, these neurons make connections that allow us to do stuff. These connections are more unique than fingerprints, and they change over time. 
And in particular, in this context, everyone thinks they know more than they do. That statement that everyone thinks they know more than they do is, is a key element of, of a work that Daniel Kahneman did for which he won the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics in 2002. But Kahneman is not an economist. He's a research psychologist. And starting in the 1970s, he and, an, um, and a collaborator named Amos Tversky invented all kinds of different ways of asking questions that exposed how, uh, fundamental defects in how people think and make decisions. And in the process of doing that, they, um, they invented basically a, a, a field, a, a subfield of both psychology and economics called behavioral economics. It's showing that the model that economists have been using for years of the rational person is not how people actually think, okay? <laughs> so that relates to the police, the incarceration rate because, because incarcerations are not driven that by crime and people's uh, actual experiences with crime, they're driven by what they get from the media, okay? And the mainstream media everywhere exploit uh, this fundamental defect that if people think they know more than they do to benefit those who control the money for the media. And so around 1975, the mainstream commercial, the major commercial broadcasters in the United States began to fire nearly all the investigative journalists and replace them with the police blotter. So the public thought that crime was out of control when there had been no substantive uh, change in crime uh, to justify that change. Uh, they voted in a generation of politicians who got tough on crime, Lincoln sentencing and so forth and so on. Um, part of this was discriminatory. Um, crack cocaine was uh, punished more severely than powder because powder is a drug of choice of whites and, and uh, crack is more used in, uh, among people of color. And um, this is the result. Uh, now there's something else that started increasing about 1975. And that's income inequality. And my data on that starts in 1947 Census Bureau data that shows that the income distribution in the United States stayed basically stable while the average was increasing, but the distribution itself, the variability, income inequality was stable from 1947 to 1970, and then it started increasing in 1970 or 75 or 1980, somewhere along in there. Um, but to, before I talk more about that, I wanna talk about the evolution of uh, economic growth in the United States, uh, the average annual income, um, real gross domestic product per capita adjusted for inflation. There's a website called measuringworth.com that has the, the data I like the best on this, between um, 1790, when George Washington was president, to 1929, the US economy grew at an average of a percent and a half per year. Uh, then it fell like a rock during the four years, at 8% per year during the four years of Herbert Hoover administration. And then it took off like a rocket um, during the uh, 12 years of the Franklin Roosevelt administration, increasing at 8% per year then. And then there was a two-year post-World War II um, recession that's not even mentioned in the history books, where it fell by 8% per year for two years. But everybody was flush with savings bonds and war bonds that they bought during World War II. And so the nation had a big party and nobody knows, noticed the recession since then. 
the economy has grown at about 2% per year. And, and if you look at a plot of this on what is called log scale, a straight line looks like um, a constant percentage increase looks like a straight line. So we have this straight line that starts in 1790, runs to 1929, and then we have a zigzag period for Hoover um, and, um, and Franklin Roosevelt. And then we've got the post-war period that we're living in today. So I mentioned that to bring it back to the discussion of, of income. Basically, the average annual income since 1947 has, as I said, increased at 2% per year. And that, those gains were broadly shared until about 1970. Now, at that rate of increase, the average um, actually um, means that in, in the 40 years between 1970 uh, and 2010, the average doubled. Uh, and I was involved with Occupy San Jose at that time. And so I kind of got interested in looking at this and there was starting to be talk of income inequality. And so I did some analysis, the median line, 50% of, of, uh, of the population is below the median and 50% is above, increased only 23%. Now this was family income so in 1970, the median American family income in constant 2012 dollars um, was, was a little over $50,000. So if that had doubled, the, um, the median American family in 20, by 2010 would be making over 100,000. But they weren't, they were only making a little over 60,000. And so that gap was 40,000. Round that down to thirty-six thousand five hundred. You've got a uh, hundred dollars a day, uh, three thousand dollars a month uh, in income that people did not get because of increase in, uh, in income and uh, because of increases in income inequality. If the gains in productivity growth since nineteen seventy had been broadly shared by by um, 2010, the median American family would, 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 would have been taking home more than $100 a day more money, all right? And I claim that that's money, in essence, that the typical American family pays to watch television. <laughs> now, that may sound pretty silly, but that's what the, um, that's related to what the uh, criminologist, uh, the criminal, criminology professors uh, talked about in the social construction of crime. Uh, to carry this uh, a step further, news is in fact a public good, what economists call a public good. And uh, that's because corruption, political corruption is limited by what, by what the public demands. And let me draw this point. Um, if I know the perfect solution to crime. It's not going to ben benefit me a whit. Um, because I'm only going to get frustrated because nothing's likely to happen if I'm the only one who knows about it, right? If, on the other hand, a critical mass of the electorate knows and understands what to do to fix the crime problem in, the, in Kansas City and the United States of America, it will happen, whether I know it personally or not. My point is, we, you and I benefit from what others demand and have demanded in, in the past. And let me even say this. Uh, in fact, the, relatively, the position of the United States, uh, the leadership position the United States enjoys on the international political economy is a result of the slow, steady, economic growth that has occurred in the United States since um, 1790. So we benefit today from news published over 200 years ago that encouraged literacy and limited political corruption, both of which, as I said, helped the United States grow, while contemporary New Spain, Mexico, fractured, shrank, and stagnated economically. 
My point on this is we need a diverse partisan press. And I stress the word partisan, that the concern for professional journalism, Robert, uh, journalism scholar Robert McChesney says, and I think McChesney has spoken at All Souls, if I remember correctly, uh, not necessarily the forum, but uh, he's been here. <clears throat> in any case, McChesney says that, that the standards of professional journalism came in in the early tw uh, 20th century in a reaction to public complaints about yellow journalism uh, that was being, um, w was a feature of the major newspaper chains of that day. Um, now, let me uh, talk, go back and talk about crime data, and then I'll come and talk more about, um, about, um, um, news, okay? What's a crime, the definition of crime changes over time and between subcultures. H data on homicide is easiest to collect and compare and other crimes often track with that. Um, so with a, a, a massive, ma some effort I managed to get data on homicide rate uh, that's and they, they typically people who study homicide in the modern era typically talk about the homicide rate per hundred thousand people in the United States. And I have I've seen data on this since 1925. It was a little over in 1925. It was a little over eight per hundred thousand. It went up to almost ten, and then down to 4.2 or so. And um, in the late 1950s, and then during the uh, the beaten, especially the the hippie uh, movement and and um, the the youth culture, the baby boomers, it rose to over ten over ten per hundred thousand, and plateaued for a while, and then in the early 90s started to fall like a rock. And I've been uh, reading, and then and it's then it's since 2010, it started coming back up again. Uh, and I've been reading a, a book by a man named Steven Pinker um, on uh, the better uh, angels of our nature that was Abraham, the closing line in Abraham Lincoln's first inaugural address. Um, and uh, when he was trying to, when he was, uh, Southern states had already seceded, but but the, the war had not yet begun and he was hoping to um, avert a war basically. So in any case, Pinker says that we don't know why all of these changes have occurred in the homicide rate. There's clearly some, some systemic things going on. If we look at the homicide rate uh, in Canada and in Europe, they show the same general pattern, but at a lower level. They've, their homicides rate are 10 or 20% of ours, uh, but they still show this same up and down and up and down pattern, which um, Pinker says, you, you know, there's, there's the, the, crime rate is more or less independent of the, of the, of the incarceration rate. Um, so on this point now, I'd like to uh, make a plug for next week's All Souls Forum. Melinda Hanneberger, who's a com columnist with the Kansas City Star, won a Pulitzer Prize recently uh, for uncovering crime and, and corruption in Kansas City, Kansas. In fact, there's been <clears throat> some of the reporting on that <clears throat> noted that the FBI was, was concerned in 1992 that, that, that there was major problems in the Kansas City, Kansas Police Department, but they were frustrated because there did not seem to be the political will to do anything about it. So why was there no political will? My answer is, 
the same phenomenon we've been talking about. If you're a journalist and you, you, you got to get a news story for tonight's uh, nightly news from the desk sergeant, you're going to think twice about reporting on questionable activities by some law enforcement officer because the desk sergeant might not want to give you the story that you need to fill the time in the nightly news. And that, and that could be a problem for, for not just you, but for your boss, okay? So in any case, let's talk now about, uh, let's go back to the media and let's talk about the, uh, the early uh, 1800s. There's a man named Alexis de Tocqueville who visited the uh, relatively new United States in 1831. Frenchman, he went back to France and wrote a book on democracy in America that has become a famous word, uh, work since. In the United States, he noted that there are many, many newspapers. He said, there's scarcely a Hamlet that doesn't, does not have its own newspaper. Many readers um, and many associations and he says, he says that, um, that every newspaper ha had an association and vice versa, all right? Individually, he said these newspapers were very weak, but collectively they were very powerful. Contrast that with France. France had very few newspapers and very few uh, associations, but the ones they did have were quite powerful. Uh, McCh Robert McChesney, um, in 2004 book, The Problem of the Media, talked about this. And that's where I got the reference to, uh, to Tocqueville. McChesney also talks about the U.S. Postal Service Act of 1792. Under that act, newspapers were delivered up to 100 miles for a penny and beyond for a cent and a half when first class postage was between six and 25 cents. It was huge. And it created, McChesney insists, the vibrant newspaper industry that the, that the brand new United States of America had that Tocqueville saw. McChesney also said that Western Union came in in 1951 and started stringing telegraph wires. And they denied access to the telegraph to comp competitors of the Associated Press. Why? Because they had a deal with the AP. The AP would not criticize major corporations, would not criticize the, the monopoly that Western Union became. Um, and in this general bias in the news supported the increasing dominance of major corporations of the US political economy um, that produced the robber baron era of the 1890s and the early 20th century and produced the situation today where major corporations export their profits, small businesses uh, compete on price and quality, but small businesses pay taxes, big businesses compete on control of the media and the political process and pay relatively little in, in taxes. Uh, in 2010, Robert McChesney uh, joined with uh, John Nichols in uh, a book on death and life of American journalism. And part of that book, they noted that this newspaper subsidy uh, represented a, a little over two tenths of a percent of GDP between 1840 and 1844. It was hard to get figures. They don't, they don't think the numbers for that particular year were particularly different from other periods. But in any case, um, then in just last December, uh, McChesney and Nichols published a, um, a research report um, and they uh, included a discussion of newspapers as a percent of GDP compiled by the Pew Research in 1956 newspaper revenue was a little over 1% of, of the national uh, economy. And in 2021, it's less than a 10th of a percent. Uh, and 
that's not the only thing that's driving the political polarization that we've seen in, in the United States today. I don't think they're the only, they're not the only thing that's, that, that's been cited in my research as driving the um, January 6th storming of the Capitol last year that tried to prevent uh, the uh, um, certification of, of Joe Biden as having won the 2020 election. But it is one important thing, and it's what I have time to talk about today. My, my point in this is in that in investigative journalism is expensive, um, but ignorance is more expensive. So we have all kinds of stuff available on the internet right now, but we have relatively little investigative journalism, and that's a major problem. So last December, McChesney and Nichols published um, a paper in the Columbia, uh, an article in the Columbia Journalism Review and a separate a tech report where they recommend distributing 15 hundredths of a percent uh, of the national income, not two tenths of a percent, just a little bit less than that, to local news nonprofits in proportion to votes in regular elections with a maximum of 25% of funds going to any one local news nonprofit. And they said all the news reports produced with these funds should be online uh, for free. Um, similar to the Beacon Dot Media, uh, Kelsey Ryan, um, a refugee from the Shrinking Star founded the Beacon Dot Media and their policy is steal our stuff. Just give us credit. So, and that's my vision of what of what uh, McChesney and Nichols are recommending here. Uh, we need to support vigorous, um, diverse local news. All right. You, you, to to qualify, you have to you have to have an, a website. You have to publish uh, something that you call news five days a week. Um, and and um, and 75% of your uh, salaries need to go to local journalists. Um, so McChesney and Nichols want the federal government to fund this. Uh, and I'm, um, I'm saying, well, actually, we, we can fund this locally. Um, US GDP per capita is not quite $80,000 a year, 76,000, I think, uh, when I looked recently, but let's call it 80,000. 15 hundreds of a percent of that is $120. The, Kansas, the bu city budget for Kansas City, Missouri is over um, $3,000 per person per year. Um, and 4% and of that gives us um, $120, which is what McChesney and Nichols are recommending. This roughly matches what the nation spends on accounting um, auditing, advertising, media, and public relations. And I don't know how much the city of Kansas City spends in these categories. I've tried to find out, and I've so far um, not been successful. But um, my point is uh, advertising uh, for most of the 20th century was roughly 2% of GDP. And advertising is maybe uh, often uh, disinformation, all right, <laughs> rather than and, and propaganda, rather than uh, information. Similarly, accounting accountants and auditors um, average roughly one percent of the workforce. Well, okay, so accountants and auditors make more than the average, and an accounting function includes people other than accountants right, support staff of various kinds. So um, let's call that 2%. So we got 2% for accounting and 2% for advertising, that's 4%. And I would say, by the way, in government services and in nonprofits, we routinely account for expenses to the last penny, but the accounting for results rarely gets more than lip service. So we do all kinds of experiments basically, but we don't collect the data to find out how good they are, right? That's a major problem. 
We need, we need to spend, we need to match what we spend on accounting with actual um, trying to understand the research, uh, trying, trying to understand the, the impact, what we actually got for that. And there's been some improvement in these areas. It's not all uh, a negative, but we need more. So, and let me sort of reiterate a point that I kind of made earlier better media can pay for themselves. In fact, you remember, we live today, we benefit today from news stories published in the, in the, in the 19th century that limited political corruption and, and, and um, encouraged, um, promoted economic growth. So if we can do that today, we can, it can potentially increase the rate of broadly shared economic growth um, locally, making our um, new nonprofit news media essentially free, paid from income that we would not have without it. Uh, in February 6th, Craig Aaron spoke to All Souls Forum, uh, and they said, that Craig Aaron was a co-CEO of freepress.net. He said in 2016, they started organizing town halls in every county in New Jersey, asking for people's concerns with local news, what they thought should be done about it and what they're willing to do. Uh, in 2018, the New Jersey legislature with bipartisan legislation created something called the New Jersey Civic Information Consortium that tries to respond to these concerns. And in 2020, they actually funded it. Uh, the lesson for Kansas City, uh, I'm a recently elected president of Friends of Community Media, and I'm working with the News and Public Affairs Committee of KKFI. We're interested in organizing a similar series of town halls with different community organizations, not different counties, different community organizations in the greater metro area asking what are people's concerns with local news? What do they think should be done and what, what they're willing to do about it? Um, so that's my program. To summarize something that I didn't quite say earlier, but hinted at, uh, to reduce crime rates and to improve other problems, we need number one, innovations that work. Number two, we need research documenting their effectiveness. Number three, we need media disseminating that information. And if we um, invest in nonprofit journalism, we're more likely to get more investigative journalism that are gonna go out and do a little bit of research and they're going to find the research that's that um, that's there and disseminate it, where the mainstream media too often does not want to disseminate the research because it could offend a major advertiser. Or um, finally, I want to give a shameless plug for a couple of other things that I'm going to be doing in the near future that are somewhat related to this. So May 31st, Tuesday, Radioactive Magazine, 6 to 6.30 p.m. on 90.1 FM, KKFI. I'll be talking about RightsCon, an international online human rights conference that will take place June 6 to 10. Uh, it turns out that, that I'll be facilitating a workshop on June 9th in the late net conference from 1.45 to 2.45 p.m. Central um, on using Wikipedia to advance human rights and democracy, using constructive conflict to create quality article. The primary leader in this workshop is a woman named Luisina Ferrante, who is the education and human rights manager for Wikimedia Argentina. Uh, and she organized dozens of workshops throughout Latin America that trained hundreds of people on how to, who uploaded thousands of images to Wikimedia Commons that were 
used in thousands of Wikipedia articles that got tens of thousands of views. And Patricia Diaz Rubio, who's the executive director of Wikimedia Chile, said that this work in Chile helped to break a conspiracy of silence, exposing abuses of power, excessive use of force by Chilean security forces that contributed made a major contribution, she said, to the 78% approval in a plebiscite for a process to rewrite the constitution of Chile, to replace the one written under the Pinochet dictatorship. That's huge. And, and last December, a 35 year old former student activist got 56% of the vote to become president of Chile, uh, defeating a right winger who promised to prevent the uh, new constitution from taking place. So I think I should uh, thank you all very much for your uh, attention and, um, and I will turn it over to uh, Craig. Thank you, uh, Spencer. That was very uh, interesting. Um, before we go to uh, questions and answers, uh, I just want to mention that uh, the forum uh, requires some support uh, for, uh, in order to keep going. And uh, there's two ways you can provide support to the forum. Go to the chat. Uh, you can either uh, send in a contribution to the church by mail, or you can also um, do that by uh, online. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I just want to mention that next week, which fits in perfectly to this presentation, we're going to have Melinda Hennenberger that uh, Spencer men uh, mentioned earlier, talking about uncovering crime and corruption in KCK or Kansas City, Kansas. Uh, and Melinda actually recently won the uh, Pulitzer Prize for her investigation. So uh, I can't claim we knew that was gonna happen, <laughs> but it is very timely uh, in following up on Spencer's uh, uh, talk. So now we're going to uh, go into questions and answers. Uh, and oh, if you want to uh, uh, be easily recognized, uh, go to uh, reactions down on the uh, on the bottom of your screen and you can hit the raise your hand and so that's when i know uh, i'll be able to determine uh, okay let's see who we have um lon swearingen right yeah go ahead lon uh you need to uh unmute lon Uh, still muted. Oh, there it goes. There it goes. No, what I have is a question. We do have the uh, investigative reporters. We have people that give us information, such as Julian Assange. Now he's going to, if they extradite him here, he could get 175 years in prison. How do you block that kind of stuff? Even with uh, a, a nonprofit concept for your for your uh, newspaper and your uh, inquiry in these things. Okay, my answer. My answer. We have that because of the massive consolidation of ownership of the media. If we have a more cacophonous press. Um, the media, the major commercial media are will not be it will not be as easy for them to suppress discussion of things like that. That's my oh. answer. Okay, uh, I could be mistaken, but I think that's uh, I think that's accurate. All right. Okay. Thank you for the question. <clears throat> yeah, uh, this is Craig. I'll go ahead and uh, ask a, a question. 
Um, I guess I want to repeat back to you what I think you were getting at. One is um, obviously that the decline of investigative journalism has created more of an opportunity for the economic interests who gain by the fact that we really don't know what's going on uh, can continue. And that has led to inequality. Everybody knows economic uh, inequality. And I think the example of um, Melinda Hindenburg's research on uh, KCK uh, is an example that uh, nothing really is being done uh, to improve the crime rate. Uh, but I wish you would go into a little more detail into, okay, let's say we did have better reporting. How would that, in your opinion, then uh, result in lower crime? Uh, it's, it's not quite clear to me why that would happen. Okay, so there... There's a group called Youth Ambassadors Kansas City. Uh, I talked with a couple of the founders um, in 2016, I think, maybe 2017. They said that at that time they'd had, they, they pay um, minimum wage to the kids with the worst home lives to stay after school for a couple of hours and come in for half a day on Saturday. Um, they work to keep these kids in school and doing useful and interesting stuff and keeping them out of trouble. And they, at that time, when I spoke to them, they had like 500 kids through their program. Uh, and they claimed that the, one of them had had a negative encounter with law enforcement, zero criminal convictions. That's huge if that's true. All right. I said, well, have you, um, have you had research done to, to certify this? No, you need to get uh, in, conjunction, uh, in conjunction with um, a college prof who will do the research to certify uh, what you've done. We've had all kinds of, there are any number of other programs that are similar for that, that claim that they have kept the kids off the, off the out of, out of gangs and off the streets uh, and out of prison. I want to believe. Please help thou mine <laughs> unbelief. We need the research and then we need uh, the media that's willing to uh, publish that stuff. Okay, so it's, it's really also your, and I think you'd said this at one point, the, there, we need this investment in uh, research to determine what would really work. Exactly. And it's being impeded by the lack of research and the fact that uh, the economic, certain economic interests are actually making more money in the way we have it uh, it's yeah, set up. Ex now. Exactly right. I've, I would, I've, I'm talking to people about re-entry programs. Um, I know of more than one re-entry program that's prisoners released from prison, if they get into the right kind of re-entry program, they can, they can have potentially, a, the recidivism rate is much lower uh, if, they're, if they have the right re-entry program. Otherwise, you know, 80% of them go back to prison. Okay, uh, George, you, you're on. Yes. Um... Your talk, I mean, <laughs> that's a lot of information in, that, in this talk this morning. Um, and I've I got multiple questions, but I'll stick with the one. Um, I, I, as we as listen to this, I'm curious about what kind of incentive, incentives could be put on corporations to sh demonstrate to them that it's some of this transition is in their better interest. And as an example, um, right now, uh, major employers are having a tough time finding drivers and, and people uh, to fill the jobs of people who don't want to work as much as they, as they used to. And so they, they're, having, they're having to suddenly face the fact 
that they may have to increase the wages uh, to attract people that would uh, work in these these facilities. And so uh, I see that now, and so then they say they're realizing it's in their better interest. So what can what kind of incentives could we put forward to um, inc increase the incentives for corporations to help do the right thing? Well, I've got multiple uh, answers to that. Number one, the uh, the mainstream media have a conflict of interest today in reporting on anything that happens in Washington or Jeff City or even the city uh, 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 city of Kansas City that might negatively impact on a major advertiser, uh, and uh, that's especially to tax laws, EPA, so forth. So we need better. We need a more informed electorate, and we have if we have a better informed public, they're going to demand that the politicians do more uh, and um, to redress the balance of the, the balance of power where currently, as I said, small businesses pay taxes and big businesses uh, con compete on controlling the media and the, uh, and the political power process and pay relatively little taxes. We need to we need to uh, reverse that. Also, I would say there's research that I've seen that basically says that worker cooperatives uh, tend to be have uh, uh, tend to, on average to grow faster, but be more stable. And so this is like the the, tur uh, the tortoise and the hare story. If you got a hundred turtles and a hundred rabbits running a hundred races, uh, a rabbit is going to win every race, but half of the rabbits are never going to even get, get to the finish line <laughs> okay the 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 turtles are are slow steady they're going to make it all right you want to support the turtles the in this case you want to support democracies over over um you know, autocratic governments china had a terrible time from uh, the founding of the people's republic of china in the late 40s up until the early 70s when they finally started opening their economy and participating more in the international economy but we don't know if they're going to continue or not all right uh, their growth has tends to have been more erratic uh, the growth of of autocracies has been more erratic than the growth of democracies uh, and the same is true with with uh, major corporations versus uh, uh, cooperatives, okay? The cooperatives tend to grow more stable and provide, uh, uh, and they, they don't have these, we don't have these bizarre situations like we had in 2008, where the senior executives of the international, of the major international banks uh, gave themselves huge bonuses at taxpayer expense for crashing the international economy. Okay, we've got a question at the, at the church. Go ahead. Um, along that line, I think this you've given so much information here, and I'm still struggling with one of those charts that is really full of information. And I'm a little disappointed in turnout today here online. So, and that's been true of a couple others this, this year, and I have missed some. I'm really thinking that we ought to be... Um, that this ought to be aired again somehow. And I don't know what the mechanics of all this are and time and energy, but uh, this summer again, and I'm looking at the calendar and going, could the forum like have maybe six repeats this summer, the second and fourth Sundays? Is there some way to do that that isn't incredibly cumbersome? Um, so programs that maybe got slided by their convergence with something like the annual meeting today or some other you know church activity might get more um, more more members or community members might get connected to them so that's just it's sort of a tangent but it's because this just seems so important today that um, 
you know, it's a, another part of sharing information in the media and getting the word out. So. So Bill Pierce, I, you know, I'm not, uh, that's not my issue. Bill Pierce and uh, Teresa Wilkie are, are uh, making the decisions on what fills the slots for this, this summer. Um, and I don't know, um, you know, more about that. You're talking about KKFI when you say that? Uh, yes. Yeah, and I'm talking about All Souls, too. I'm oh, okay. Right. Sundays right. at All Souls. There's a pattern of second and fourth Sundays. Sure, sure, sure. That, well, that wouldn't hit the 4th of but July. We can, have, we can we could also, Day. if the forum committee wants, we can have, uh, you know, another discussion about this in the fall or something. Oh, I've got another, oh, this is Craig, I've got another question. And it occurred to me that there's a parallel problem that's causing this, and, and that is money and politics. Uh, the combination of money and politics and television, which could account for uh, this really deficit in information for the general public. Uh, and you know that corporations are under the a, a silly Supreme Court decision are people, uh, and there's a campaign to try to turn uh, get rid of that uh, so that their money that they spend on politics is given the same uh, credence as that the people put in. So would you agree with that, that this is, that it's really even beyond what you're saying, it's also the, uh, the corporate power, which is, uh, goes through the television system because everybody watches television. Well, nearly everyone. I don't, but the answer is the answer is absolutely. The main, the broadcasters, the commercial broadcasters, all have an inherent conflict of interest in providing any information that might allow the voter to uh, to vote more intelligently. Because why? Because because if a politician could get elected without buying a lot of television ads. Oh my goodness, that's a threat to their profitability. Right. <laughs> and, and we can go on and yeah, I, there's the, uh, I agree with you. Um, the uh, Supreme Court decision talks about uh, uh, money is, uh, corporations are people, money is speech. And uh, I would add that humans are a sec our second class citizens in the United States of America today. Okay, uh, Lon, you go ahead. I think you're, you can add oh. Go ahead. All right. The, the, the question is, is the media is what it is. But the other thing is, is our whole program, our whole country is con considered unequitable. In other words, it's not fair. And how do you change that with things like you're talking about? The other part of it is you've got Chris Hedges, you've got some of these kinds of people that can't even get a lot of their stuff out to, to really get it. And basically 74 million people voted for a con artist. How does that happen? Right. Other than propaganda. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm, you know, I'm keying off of McChesney uh, who basically said that he thinks if we, uh, if we, reinvigorate local news. Right now we have relatively little investigative journalism. If we reinvest, uh, reinvigorate local news, that's gonna take care of uh, a lot of it, McChesney thinks. Now, the other thing I didn't mention um, is the so-called click economy. Facebook is the best and the worst uh, in this regard. But, but it's not just Facebook, it's other internet companies. Um, if you, for example, complain about illegal aliens on uh, your Facebook account, you will likely get a stream of stories talking about crimes committed by illegal aliens and how terrible they are and so forth and so on. If, on the other hand, you talk in, um, on Facebook about undocumented, which is another term for the same thing, you will likely get uh, research reports that say that, that um, 
sanctuary cities that that uh, that are that are uh, more friendly and supportive to these undocumented people tend to have less crime and higher median incomes. But neither side sees the news that the Facebook and the other internet companies present. So people get polarized, uh, driven into their own echo chambers, and they don't understand what the other, what's driving the other ones. H.R. Uh, McMaster, President Trump's um, second national security advisor, said that Russia is using uh, Facebook and the other internet companies uh, to increase political polarization in this way, um, and so forth and so on. So I think we need to also address that, but McChesney didn't talk about that. And so, you know, that's another issue that I think we need to address. Uh, okay, yes. uh, George, go ahead. Yes, uh, on your chart of murder uh, statistics from 1925 uh, to current, um, I, it, I, I noticed that the periods of the inc significant increase, uh, the, the, the peak periods, um, are, were periods in which the, um, the right wing or the, the, like the slave owners at the one point, the first ones, we're starting to lose control and over over their position, and then that now we're seeing a uh, another set of peaks. Uh, secondly, uh, that's essentially reflective of this uh, re replacement theory stuff by Tucker Carlson that they they're real fearful of the of the whites becoming minorities. Uh, do you see this? Uh, nonsense as being um, a critical thing to be uh, attacking vigorously? There's, there's no question. There's a substantial literature, not, I don't know about substantial, but there's a fair, a modern amount of literature that basically says that the, um, that political violence is driven by changes in social status, all right? So it's not, it's, it's not that people are necessarily all the time anti-Black or anti-Semitic or whatever. It's more that the political violence comes when people see a change in social status. So when the African-Americans were suddenly no longer slaves and, and uh, their social status increased in the reconstruction era that led to the, uh, the development of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, and uh, you can go on and on and on. Um, but there are, there's a book I have on, on um, ethnic violence in Eastern Europe uh, that I forget the title, uh, the exact title and author now, but basically so, talks about a number of different um, cases of ethnic violence in, 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 in Eastern Europe, some of what had, had nothing to do with uh, uh, anti-Semitism. And I've seen more li literature that talks about that recently. So there's no question there's an issue there. Okay, I'm gonna bring the questions uh, to a close. Uh, also, R Renee reminds us that all of our forum programs have been recorded and uploaded to YouTube for on-demand viewing. And she has put in the chat a link to do that. And we can distribute that a, a further later. Uh, that goes to the question of Carol's question about uh, repeating these programs. Uh, now, finally, I just wanna say, oh, and we're gonna have additional discussion after we stop recording. But I just want to remind everybody that we have a related program next week by Melinda Hennenberger, Uncovering Crime and Corruption in KCK. Uh, and that fits right into this uh, theme. So thanks a lot for uh, listening. And uh, we can now uh, turn off the recording, Renee, and go into a general